All right, so welcome to Space Camp. Uh, we're going to start with some introductions. Um, this workshop is for people who identify as testers, but maybe have been around Postman for a little while. We're going to cover some beginner level testing, some intermediate level testing. Um, beginners should be able to follow along just fine. Our topic today is going to be on contract testing, which is sometimes a little bit misunderstood because we can do this kind of testing on both the consumer and the producer side. So to help with this, we're going to cover both sides of this today in a handful of ways. So we'll start with some introductions. My name is Ian Douglas. I'm a senior developer advocate here at Postman. I joined the team back in January. I've been in the tech industry for a long time. I've done a lot of different kinds of roles, such as development and management and education. I got into software testing in about 2011 or so, and it changed a lot of my views on how I write software now. So I'm a big advocate for test-driven development and behavior-driven development, and I love diving in on topics like this. So I'll turn it over to Tim. Hi, I'm Tim Bosha. I joined Postman back in November uh, 2020. I'm a senior software developer engineer and test, or senior SDET. Uh, I've been in the software testing and software support space for almost nine years, doing mostly automation at the API level, automation at the UI level, performance testing, bug triaging. So near and dear to my heart, also doing a lot of coaching of uh, best practices to other folks on my team. Awesome. Cool. Thanks, Tim. Appreciate your time today uh, helping with this content today as well. So we'd like to hear from all of you a little bit. We're going to drop a poll in Zoom. So let me go ahead and launch that. And we'd like you to answer a few questions about your experience level. So we'd like to know how much experience you have around the idea of API design and how much experience you have with API testing, as well as how long you've been using Postman. So we'll give everybody a little bit of time to fill this out for us. Um, it just helps us shape what we do with Space Camp so that we have an idea around experience levels of people that join Space Camp and it'll help to shape future, uh, future content for us. So we'll give you a few seconds to fill that out and then we'll go ahead and we'll end that poll and we'll share the results with everybody and we'll chat about that really quick and then we'll move on to our content. So we'll give everybody another 10, 15 seconds or so most of you have actually answered, so we'll get that closed up here pretty soon. Appreciate everybody getting their answers in here. All right, we'll give everybody just a few more moments to fill that out, and then we'll go ahead and we'll close that poll. All right. So we got about 80% participation, which is fantastic. Appreciate that. So I'm going to go ahead and end this and we'll share the results. All right. So we got some really interesting results here. About half of our audience today have less than six months of API design and pretty split across the six month to one year, one year to three years, and more than three years of experience, around 15 to 18% for each of those. The experience with testing pretty similar kinds of results. We've got some people who are quite new to testing and some folks that have been around testing for quite a while, about 37% each on those, 13% each on the others. And then years of experience with Postman, again, uh, pretty spread out. So we appreciate all the folks that have been around Postman for a long time. And we got some uh, good percentages there, but also a handful of folks that are fairly new at Postman as well. So welcome to all of you to the Postman platform. We're going to talk about contract testing, what it is, the benefits of doing so. Ian's going to spend some time running some validation testing using the API builder within Postman and how to run automated tests from the collection runner. My section will touch on consumer driven testing and how to build some test scripts using a Postman request and then using a Postman monitor to automate this level of regression testing. All right, so let's talk about the agenda. Here's what we're gonna go through. So <clears throat> we're gonna start out by making an empty workspace uh, to do all of our work today. So in Postman, you will need to be logged into your Postman account for this to happen. Um, so we're gonna start out by building a, a workspace and we're gonna be forking some things into that workspace today. 
And then we're going to talk briefly about what is testing, like what is specifically contract testing. And then we're going to get into the main content. So as Tim mentioned, the first section of the Space Camp content is going to be on the producer side of the API builder with myself. I'm going to be sharing a download link that we can use, and you can either download a file or you can copy that URL into Postman. We're going to show you how to do that. We're going to do some open API specification work, and we're going to build out a test suite. We're going to learn how to use the built-in validator within Postman. And then from there, we're going to go into some automated scripting, uh, as Tim described. Um, and then from there, uh, I'm going to hand it over to Tim. And Tim's going to talk about client-side contract testing using some Postman tests uh, within the sandbox. And we're going to be working with a library API that we used in a previous Space Camp. So you can go back and you can review some of those other Space Camp videos if you want more detail. Well, um, Tim is also going to touch on Postman monitors, which Ruby and Arlemy did, I think, uh, two Space Camps ago or one Space Camp ago, uh, where they went into a lot of detail around Postman monitors. And so if you need more information on how to do the testing or how to do monitors, we do have previous Space Camp videos that you can go see for those. We're going to wrap up the session by sharing some resources uh, for further learning and further work in Postman. And we're also going to close out with Q&A. So as a reminder, there's a Q&A uh, option in Zoom that you can use to drop your questions in there. I think, uh, I'm not sure if chat is working yet. I think Arlemy is working at getting chat uh, working. So if you do have questions as we go throughout the content today, please use the Q&A panel for that. As a reminder, we are recording. We'll share the recording out with everybody. Once the session is over, you should get an email from Zoom and uh, and let everybody know, um, you know how to get those, uh, how to get those videos. Um, and then let's see. So I think we'll uh, we'll dive into our, our content. So why do we even do testing? What is testing? So for those who are new to the idea of testing, the, the reason that we test the software that we build and the things that we build is to give us that confidence. Today's session, we're gonna focus on three different perspectives of what we call API contract testing. We're gonna start by importing an open API specification that shows how your team might work through the design stage if, if you've heard the phrase API first, we're going to show a little bit about how you might do this API first design inside of Postman and make sure that everything is lining up between the definition of what you're trying to build and what you want your users uh, to have as an experience for uh, getting ready to go develop the API. From there, we're going to look at some automated testing to make sure that the API definition itself actually conforms to the open API specification standards. And we've got some automated ways of doing that. And finally, we're going to take a look at the consumer side, as we've mentioned, to make sure that the end user is actually getting what we expect. And so by looking at it from three different perspectives, three different angles, we're going to have the utmost confidence that what we talk about as an API contract is actually uh, what we want our user experience to be. So what is contract testing itself? Well, we've talked about the benefit of it when it comes to that confidence, when it comes to the idea of a contract is, is basically the agreement between us as the API producers, as well as the API consumer to communicate how to use an API and sort of the guidelines around that. And this is done by having a well-documented set of endpoints and examples of both success and failure scenarios so that your users know exactly what is going to happen if they call your API in a particular way. It sets up a very clear path about how to communicate with your API and to offer guidance about how to debug things if things don't work out. So the confidence that we talked about in the middle of that other slide also lends itself to the user's confidence. So they come to have an expectation when they use any of your APIs uh, that they're gonna work in a particular way. This kind of comes back to the idea of your governance team who is designing what that user experience is going to be. And so having their expectation set is also going to be really helpful as you work across all of, uh, as your users work across all of your APIs. So the image that you see here is, is a pretty, uh, pretty big oversimplification of what we're presenting today, but we wanted to give you an idea of this before we jump into the hands-on demos from here. So when it comes to contract validation for API producers, um, we're going to show you, uh, like I mentioned, we're going to create a workspace. We're going to walk everybody through that. 
And then we're going to share a URL to go get an open API specification file. Now, if you want to use your own open API specification, that would be fine. But we're going to have an example that everybody can pull in and use uh, if you don't have an open API specification. Um, and then we're going to go in, we're going to run the validators, we're going to do the automated scripting, as we've mentioned, and then we'll hand it over to Tim from there. All right, so we're going to get our moderator team to drop this first link in chat. And you can do one of two things. Um, we can, um, you can either copy this URL to your clipboard and we're gonna paste that URL or you can download the file and you can import that file. And I'll show you both places to do that. So we'll give everybody a moment to, uh, to get this link. Uh, Pooja just dropped that in chat for everybody. And it looks like uh, chat has to be like, we would have to restart the whole session to get the regular chat working. So apologies for that. Please continue to use the Q and A panel for questions. Um, and, and the moderator team will do their best to answer those as we go. So we'll give everybody a moment to go grab that URL, and then we're going to switch over and do a demo in, uh, within the Postman application itself. Now I'm going to be using the desktop application for Postman. You can use the web application or the desktop application. Both of them should work fine for what we're going to be working through today. So again, you can open this URL directly if you want to kind of view what that open API specification file looks like in YAML format, or you can just copy that URL and have the URL ready to go. You can use the short URL or you can use the resolved URL, which is a file on GitHub. Either one of these are going to work fine in Postman. All right, so let's go over to Postman. We're going to start by making a new workspace. So in the menu bar of the application at the very top, we're going to click on workspaces and we're going to click on the button that says create workspace. We need to give this workspace a name. So I'm just going to call this space camp uh, API contracts. You can choose to put a summary in here if you like. You can also choose whether you want personal access, private access, team access. I'm just going to leave most of these things set as default values today. And I'm going to go ahead and click on the button that says create workspace. And then the interface redirects us back to our brand new workspace where we can go in and start defining things from here. The first thing I'm going to do in our context bar over here is I'm going to click on APIs. We see we don't have any APIs yet, and so we're going to go ahead and we're going to import this API. So I'm going to click on the import button. And from that import button, we have a lot of options here. So if you downloaded that file, if you saved it on your system, you can click on the upload files button and you can manually upload that file. We can also click on link here as well, and we can actually paste in that link. So either of those two options will work. So if you've already opened up the file or if you've saved a copy on your system, you can upload that file manually. Or if you wanna use your own YAML file, you can upload that directly into here. Or if you have a link to an open API specification file, you can use that. So you can use the short URL that we've pasted in chat. Or if you've, if you've actually opened that in your browser, you'll see that it expands out to a GitHub link. You can paste in that whole GitHub link here as well. So I'm going to go ahead and click on continue. And we see that it's going to open as, uh, as an open API version 3 specification. The one change that we need to do here is by default, it's going to try to open this as documentation. We want to set this drop down to say test suite. This will save us a little bit of time. If you've already imported it as documentation, I'll show you quickly how to go build a test suite out of this. So we're going to choose test suite from that drop down. We're going to leave everything else as defaults and we're going to click on the import button. This should give us a confirmation that everything imported okay. I'm going to go ahead and click on the button that says confirm and close. Now we can see that I've got my library API set up in here. Now, if you set this up as documentation, what you can do is you can click on the draft word here. And what this draft is, is just a, it's a version. It's just a string of a version. Um, if you import it as documentation, what you can do is you can click on the test tab here on the workbench. And you can click on the button over here that says add test suite and you can give it a name and it should build a new collection of all of the examples of the endpoints and, and their example outputs um, as a new collection using that test suite if you imported it as a test suite then you don't need to do this step so let's go take a look at what actually imported from here 
we can see we've got two endpoints, one endpoint to fetch a book from our library and an endpoint to get all of the books from our library. And then we had examples for each of these. So we have an example of fetching a single book. We have also have an example of fetching multiple books. In this case, because of the example data that we had in our open API specification, it's actually putting the exact same data in here multiple times. But what we wanna pay attention to here are the square brackets, which indicate we have an array of results coming back here. So if we click on draft and we come back to the definition tab, we can actually see the open API specification over here. Now you can go and you can make uh, changes directly in the interface here if you like. We also have other videos that you can find on our YouTube channel. Um, if you wanna learn how to connect the repository to uh, integration systems like GitHub or GitLab, if you wanna be able to synchronize this back and forth with a repo, we've got some uh, how-to videos on how to do these. For most teams, you're going to spend some time in here defining out your API, and you're going to be adding new endpoints and, and your HTTP methods and so on, what your responses are going to look like, and you might define some of your components and so on down here. For some folks, though, it's a little bit easier to work backwards and say, you know, if, if you're not as familiar with the open API specification, for example, you might actually want to go look at the example output and say, okay, I can see this JSON format here. Um, and maybe there's some changes that we want to make here. As an example, we know that a book can have multiple authors. So maybe we want to come in here and we want to change what we have here uh, for a single author. And we want to make this an array of strings. So I've changed the name from author to authors, plural. And then what I'm doing is I'm highlighting this in Postman. And then I can hit just the open square bracket key on my keyboard and it'll automatically add the closing square bracket here at the end. And this would indicate an array of strings. I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to make that same change over here for fetching all of our books. I'm just going to go ahead and change both of these examples to also be arrays. Because maybe this is how our team wants to work on this planning a little bit. So what we're going to do from here is I'm going to show you how to run the validator inside of Postman to see um, like how Postman is going to detect that these things are now out of sync between what we want our example to be and what we've defined our API to be. So you have to make sure that when you change these examples that you either click on the save button in the interface or you can use a hotkey on your keyboard. If you're on a Mac, it would be Command S. If you're on a Windows machine, it'll be Control S. And uh, we're going to go ahead and we saved both of those changes to our example. What we can do from here is I'm going to click back on draft at the top and I'm going to go over to that test tab over here again. So again, I just clicked on the draft version of our API and from here I'm going to click on test. And we see a button here that says validate and what we're going to do is we're going to click on this validate button. What this is going to do is it's actually going to check the examples that we have against the definition that we've made. And it's going to uh, make sure that these things are lined up. In this case, it's taking a moment to run. It normally happens quite quickly. So I might refresh my screen here and see if I can get this to run a little bit faster. So let's go back and try and run that again. Looks like the validator is having some issues. Usually this runs really, really quickly. Give this a moment to see what's going on here. Yay for live demos. What the interface would be showing us at this point is that um, it found some issues. And if we click on that link, we would be able to go see what those issues actually are. Um, Arlemy is suggesting turn it off and on again. <clears throat> so let's try that. I'll just, uh, I'll close out Postman. <clears throat> I'll start up Postman again, excuse me. All right, so I'm gonna expand this out. I'm gonna to go to back draft version here again. I'm gonna go over to test mode and I'm gonna click on this validate button one more time. Of course, it's having a problem when I'm trying to live demo this. <laughs> um, so what this validator is doing is it's actually comparing the definition of our open API specification with the examples that we've built. And because we've changed the example 
it would actually be coming up with a notification saying that there's a problem. In that test, uh, in this test tab, if it found an error here, you would see if you can discern the color yellow, um, it would say that it found issues. And when you click on that, it would actually open a panel showing you what it found and what it was expecting to find. And what it, it will, it'll also try to make suggestions on how to correct this. And what we would be seeing on that screen is Postman trying to resolve the issues between the definition and what we've changed our example to be. And in that example, uh, it would say, you know, you've added authors, but the definition says that we're supposed to have just an author as well. <clears throat> and so what I would normally be seeing on that screen is that it's trying to add another author here at the bottom uh, in, in single format where it's adding another string of a single author. But we don't want Postman to correct that. We want it to be authors. We want this to be an array. And so what we need to do is we need to go in now and correct the definition. So again, this is one way that your team might be working. And if they don't understand the open API specification, they may come in and work on these examples directly hands-on and try to manipulate these examples. So what we need to do here is we need to go in and look at the definition and see what we need to change in the definition. So I'm gonna scroll all the way down to the bottom where we actually have the schema for our book where we define the ID and the title and the author and so on. And we wanna make sure that this is authors plural. Now up here at the top, we also have uh, a notification here that says that the author is actually a required field. We have to make sure that we pluralize this one as well. So anywhere that we have the word author in the specification, we now have to make sure that this becomes plural, but it's not just a single string anymore. And so what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna add just a couple of lines here that tell it that this is gonna be an array. So I'm gonna say that the type of this is gonna be an array. And then for each of the items that we have in here, I'm gonna indent the rest of this. And so what I changed in here was I went from the word author to authors, plural. And then I indented the previous definition of the type of string. And I added these new components here that said authors is now gonna be a type of array. And each of the items in that array is going to be a type of string. And then the open API specification allows us to add a description as well as example data. So now if I were to go run the validator again, um, it should match up now to recognize that we have an array of strings as our authors. So let's go try that one more time. Let's see if we can get that validator to work. If we click, uh, so whether you have errors or whether it succeeded for you, you can always click back on that validate result and you'll see a little pop-up here that will let you validate again. Or if you had errors, you would see another button here that says that there were errors and you can go in and see what those are. So we'll try the validator one more time. Looks like it's failing for me again. Yep, that's not gonna work for us. So unfortunately, uh, we ran into a, a problem with this. Um, so yeah, so this validation is basically comparing our open API specification with what we want our examples to be. And so it's watching the JSON format of our example output of what we want our end user to see, along with the definition of what we're trying to build. So I'm going to go ahead and I'm going to save this change to the definition. And uh, what I'm going to do just for the sake of time is I'm going to move on to the next step. Um, not sure why the Postman validator is not running here but uh, we'll go examine that. But normally this validator runs very, very quickly on the specification to compare against those examples. So we're just gonna go ahead and move on from here. What we're gonna do from here is we're gonna go look at another workspace and we're gonna bring some of the work from that workspace into our workspace. At the very top of the interface, we're gonna see a search bar in the, in the menu bar at the very top, we're gonna see the search bar. And what we wanna search for in here is we want to look for a contract test generator. So those are the three words that you're going to want to search for. I'll go ahead and drop that in chat here as well. Uh, the team is actually going to drop a link to it as well if you just want to open that directly. And you want to make sure that you're opening the one that was made by Postman. So I'm going to go ahead and open this up. And I'm going to click on the collections icon in the context bar. What we can see here is we've got two collections. We have one for open API specification version two, or if you're familiar with the word swagger, 
Swagger was basically uh, adopted and, and changed into OpenAPI spec. And so OpenAPI uh, version two is effectively Swagger and then OpenAPI three is the newer version. And so we have these automated test builders that we're actually gonna copy into, into our workspace. Now, because we're working with OpenAPI spec version three, I'm only gonna copy these contract tests. I'm not gonna copy version two. We don't need those. We're working with version three, so I'm just gonna copy the version three. The other thing that we need to copy from here is an environment. And the environment is basically setting up variables that will allow um, these tests to uh, build out some of the automation here. So what we're gonna do from here is something that we call forking. And forking is basically making a copy, but remembering a reference back to where we got it from. If you're familiar with using forking in GitHub, that's basically what's happening is for now, just think about it like we're just gonna make a copy for what we need. So I'm gonna hover over the open API spec three version of our contract tests. And I'm gonna click on the three dots next to it. And I'm gonna scroll down to the option that says create a fork. Now we need to give this a label and I'm just gonna call it my name and we need to tell it which workspace this is going to go into. So I'm gonna choose my Space Camp API contract workspace that we just made. Now, when I click on the fork collection button, it's gonna fork that collection over and put us back in our workspace, but we need to come back here to the contract test generator to grab another piece of data later. So for now, I'm gonna click on fork collection. We're gonna see that it's gonna redirect us back to our workspace, but we wanna go back to the contract test generator workspace to grab the environment from here. All right, something went wrong building a fork. Having all kinds of fun with live demos today. All right, so that fork got created for us and we can see now that that's uh, over here in my collection but we have to go back to that contract test generator because we wanna grab the environment as well. So I'm just gonna click on that search bar again where the contract test generator words were already there. I'm gonna go ahead and reselect the contract test generator workspace. Now in the context bar, I'm gonna click on the environments icon and we see an environment here called contract test environment. We can also fork this environment over as well. So again, I'm gonna click on the name. I'm gonna click on the three dots next to it and I'm gonna select create a fork from the submenu that comes up. Again, we have to give this a name. I'm just gonna call it Ian again. And again, we have to select the workspace. Now there are a few things that we're gonna to need to go uh, build into this. And I'm gonna talk about that really briefly. Uh, we're gonna need a Postman API key. And we also need to know the ID value of the workspace that we're currently working in. So I'm gonna go ahead and fork this environment over. And then I'm gonna talk briefly about how to go get that Postman API key. So when we look at the environment, so again, it brought us back to our own workspace and there are a few values that we need to set here. The first one is gonna be this ENV-API key. And this is where we wanna put a Postman API key. So for now, I'm just gonna write Postman API key just as a placeholder that we know that this is uh, something that we need to fill in. We also need to fill in this workspace ID and I'm gonna show you where to go get, the, go get that. And then there's one more change that we need here and that's to set our server name here. This has to match the server that we have in our open API specification. I'm gonna set this to localhost on port 3000 for the time being. I'm just gonna drop that in chat just so you can copy and paste that if you like. And then I'm gonna show you where to go get your Postman API key. The fastest way for me to do this is going to be in a browser. So I'm just going to go back over to my slide browser here and I'm going to go to postman.com. I'm going to show you where to go get uh, your own Postman API key. Of course, I'm going to try not to expose my own here. But what you want to do is you want to click on your profile icon at the top and you're going to go into your settings. So you're going to click on your profile and you're going to click on settings. And from here, you'll see a menu option on the left called API keys. And on that screen, you should have the ability to generate a new API key. So I'm gonna do that off screen just so I don't expose my own API key. And uh, I'm gonna go build that really quickly. So again, I'm clicking on my profile icon. I'm going to settings. I'm gonna click on the API keys. 
And from here, you should see an option to create a new API key. So I'm going to go grab that. Now, <clears throat> one change that we need to make in Postman is how we're actually saving these. We have two different variable types in here. One is called default, which will show us visually what that string is. And there's also a secret option. And when I select the secret option, notice how it masked what I pasted in here. If I highlight this and try to type anything else, it also stays masked. And so we do, uh, we do hope that you'll use the secret option here when you paste in your API key. Do not add it in initial value. Anything that you put inside initial value will synchronize to the Postman server. And if you're working on a public facing uh, uh, workspace, then anybody else can come in and click on that little eyeball icon and expose what your API key is. So we would ask that you set this to secret, only paste your API key inside current value. If you want to unmask it to verify that it was done correctly, you can. Um, from here, we're going to need our workspace ID. So to get our workspace ID, just underneath the menu bar, where we have, in my case, Space Camp API Contracts, I'm going to go ahead and click on that name. And we see some definition about our workspace that we're in. And on the side here, we see an information icon called Workspace Details. And I'm going to click on that icon. And this is where we can see our workspace ID. Next to that, we have a button that will allow us to copy that workspace ID to our clipboard. So I'm just going to copy that value to my clipboard. And I'm going to go back to my environment. And I'm going to paste that inside my workspace ID. Now, in this case, it's OK that I'm showing you my workspace ID. You can't do anything with it um, other than access it, but it's public anyway. Um, but you won't be able to access anything in here because I've made this secret. And these current values don't synchronize with, uh, with the Postman server anyway. So the three changes that we made is we fetched an API key, we put in a workspace ID, and we changed our server to be localhost 3000. If I'm working a little quickly, I apologize. Part of it's for the sake of time uh, because we lost a little bit of time uh, trying to run those tests over and over. Um, you can always come back and watch the, uh, the video recording and uh, you can kind of pause things to work at it at your own pace. So I'm going to go ahead and click on the Save button here to make sure that I save all those changes. And then we're going to go back over to the Collections icon in our context bar. And what we're going to do here is I'm going to select the Open API specification that we forked over. And what we want to do now is we want to run all of the test code that's built in here. So I'm going to start by closing this documentation panel. And at the very top, you should see an icon that says run. What this is going to do is it's going to go run some JavaScript code that's built into all of these collections. And this is what we call our collection runner. I'm going to click on the button here that says I want to run all of these contract tests. And what this is doing is it's actually, well, it's supposed to be scanning through everything that we need to. Uh... Oh, why is that complaining? I think that we need the active environment. Oh, that's right. Quickly. Yes, thank you, Tim. Appreciate uh -huh. that. Yep. Mm -hmm. So we have to make sure before we run it, we actually pick the environment here at the top. And then we're going to say run again. Otherwise, it can't. It doesn't know where to find my uh, doesn't know where to find my Postman API key. All right, I'm just going to close that generator and we'll start this again. So I'm going to click on contract tests. Click on that run button. Tell it to run those tests. And now we can see it's actually automating going through and it's scanning everything that we need. Um, and so it's, it's building these tests on the fly by going and looking at all of the specifications inside our open API spec. And it's actually automatically uh, building out tests to go test all of those properties, all of their values, um, and making sure that everything conforms to the open API specification. Now up at the top here, we can see that several of these actually failed. And so that lets me know now that my open API specification actually doesn't match what the open API specification uh, uh, team actually says it should conform to. So if we click on failed, we see, for example, I made a schema called book with a lowercase b, 
And in the specification, it says, no, all of those schemas should start with a capital letter. And so it's letting us know in, in very fine detail um, how to go correct our open API specification. So now we can go back and we can actually make some changes here. It's also suggesting that our error schema, uh, we have that message option in there. Um, so in our error, I think I'm sending a status code and an error message, and it says that error message should have a description and it should also have an example. And so it's giving us very clear instructions on what we need to go add to our open API specification. Now, is this stuff strictly required? Maybe not, but if your team uses other tools with your open API spec to go generate code or generate other documentation or to generate other things about what you're producing as an API, making sure that this conforms to the open API specification could be really important. And so these contract test generators, and I think I'll stop here and hand it over to Tim so we don't run out of time today. Um, this will actually go through and it'll automate a lot of things. It, depending on the size of your open API specification, this collection alone could generate hundreds of automated tests now, it's just going to run as is. It doesn't save those tests anywhere. You would have to come in here and tell it to run this again and again. So as you make changes, it'll actually go through. And by, by adding your Postman API key, it's actually going in and it has access now to go read your open API spec. And then based on what it finds in that open API spec file, it's generating all these tests for you. So very handy utility. Um, do recommend that you... Uh, that you uh, check out that contract test generator. All right, from here, I'm going to hand it over to Tim just so we don't run out of time today. Uh, so Tim, why don't you walk us through the consumer side? Yeah, absolutely. Uh, to reiterate on the consumer side, we're just going to make sure that the user now has access to this API at a consumer level, and they're seeing what's expected from the server side. It's seeing that it's documented appropriately. And again, as Ian mentioned, it gives us another level of insurance or another level of confidence. So I'm going to go to a previous base camp. I'm going to go to the search bar at the top. I'm going to type in Postman Space Camp. Again, we're going to make sure that it is the one that's created by Postman. And in the previous, an introduction for testers collection, you can catch the recording to see where we set the stage for contract testing. We'll click on the contract testing folder and the JSON schema v4 validation. So here we're using a client or consumer side. They have access to this library API and a books endpoint, which is returning an array of books. So we're going to follow a similar structure and define a schema and its type and its properties. And we're going to be using a built-in schema validation method. But just to briefly outline, there's some JSON schema validators built right into Postman, AJV, or another JSON schema validator, as well as TB4, tiny validator for JSON schema. Uh, we'd recommend using AJV, and that's the built-in method that we'll be using. TV4 is a bit out of date, and its validations are a little bit more cryptic to indicate what's, what's going wrong. So the collection that we're going to be using right below the Postman API contract testing collection. I'll close the documentation right context bar. Uh, so this will have two requests, one returning one book. We've included a hard-coded book ID in as a path variable, as well as we'll then test against a whole array of books. So what I like to do first, where it is the read-only collection, is fork this collection. So I'll Select the collection, hover over the three dot view more actions, and I'll select create a fork. Again, I'll give it a simple label of damn contract testing. 
and I'll select the workspace dropdown, and we can use that same workspace that we created for Ian's section. Then I'll select for collection. And we'll close it. No, just and just hit the. We'll just hit that again. We'll try it a, a second. Yeah, time. it seemed to work. Where we were doing it earlier on. No, all right. We'll just try it again here. Mm -hmm. I'm just going to call it Tim in this case, just to speed it up here a little bit. Sure. There we go. Great. So now we're in the team workspace. We can see that the fork has been added. Let's expand the collection and select the book request. So again, this is fetching one book. I could send the request and see what it's returning. That same Creativity Inc. book title. And I'm going to select the test section and as I mentioned, we're going to use the built-in schema validator of Postman. So we have the PM response to have JSON schema. I'll select the test result, and this will give us a good way to start our uh, client-side testing, consumer-side testing. So right away, we can see that the schema hasn't been defined. So as we did in the previous example, let's go ahead and create a variable for this schema. And I'll simply use two curly braces, save my request by selecting save and send. So the schema validator isn't too picky if I simply just use an empty schema variable, but we can follow a similar structure to what we did on the server-side validation to use a type, use properties. So I'll start by testing against its type. So as we can see, this is an object that we're housing one book's properties. So I'll use type and of type object. I can send the request that it passed, but very important thing to always validate against is that our tests do in fact fail and they fail meaningfully. So let's make sure that this will in fact fail. We could choose another type such as a number or a string. So here the validator is very helpful to indicate that it's expecting a string, but what's being shown is an object. We can see that the validator is doing its job. Change it back to object. Next, we could test various properties of this object. So we'll add a comma and a new line and use the properties field, colon, curly braces. And we could choose to validate against any one of these properties. Let's use the title. And we can validate in a similar fashion to what we did for type object, we can validate the titles type. Again, it is a type string. I'll send the request, see that it passed. Again, we could make sure it fails. Let's change type to a type number. Here again, the property should be expecting a number. What we're seeing is a string. We'll change it back once again. We can validate to make sure that certain fields are in fact included using the required value. I could use required, 
here we use square brackets to denote an array of all the different properties that we expect to see. So let's validate that the title is in fact required. Send the request. See that the validations path trades as another point, as always in testing or in any form of development, to be careful with your spelling and your casing. If I was, for instance, to look for titles, as Ian changed in a similar fashion with author and authors, we would need to be careful to go and change this level of validation as well, it's expecting something with titles. But what we have is title. Here, casing also, I believe, matters. If we were to change it to an uppercase title, this again is going to fail the validation. I'll change it back to a lowercase title. The last section that I want to touch upon for this request is something that gives us some insurance if new fields were ever to be added. So we want to make sure that we're alerted if, for instance, they were to add a new property, maybe the price of the book or other things that this book API might want to include. So we want to make sure that our test would fail if there's any properties being added along the way. For this, we'll use the value of additional properties. This is a, a Boolean or a true false flag. So if I set it to false, we're saying that I don't expect any other properties other than title. So this should fail. Now, as we can see, every one of the other properties other than title has its own error message. So powerful way to give us some insurance to make sure that no new properties are being added. So I'll go ahead and comment this out. I'll save the request just to be sure. So next we'll move on and touch on a few strategies that would uh, a whole array of books. So our second endpoint, if we send the request, we're seeing a array of book objects are being returned. So every single book in the library. Hey Tim, uh, let me just, hey Tim, let me just close that uh, notification here. There we go. go oh ahead. yeah, thanks. Uh, yep, same structure. We're gonna define the schema, validate against it. To save a bit of time, where I'm limited with Zoom chair. If Ian, if you could copy paste lines two to nine, please. Yep. Great, thanks. Uh, okay, so this will give us a good starting point to start testing against the schema. Uh, we should expect some changes that we're gonna need to make right out of the gate. It's no longer of type object, but of type array. So let's send the request and see what it does. Oh, again, we have it of type object and what we're actually seeing is an array. First thing that we'll change is of type array. Let's send the request. And here we can see some limitations of, uh, of validators and almost false positives that can happen. So what we have is of properties title and a required title, but we haven't actually drilled into this individual object or the items within the array. So always need to do our due diligence and make sure that our tests are passing or failing for what they're supposed to do. So what we're going to use is the field of items to help us unravel each book property for each book's object. So I'm gonna go ahead and use the items block. I'll open the brackets. Going to add my closing bracket where appropriate. And here we would have, we could check on its type. 
So now we have each of the items is a book object. I'm going to shuffle these along and indent them. Be sure to add a comma. I'll send the request. You can see that the validation is passing. passing. So we've nested uh, each of the items, and we're using the same structure as that book endpoint. Uh, we can do some validations against the array. So just two quick validations that we'll do. One is called the min items or the minimum items that we expect to see. This gives us some insurance that the response is uh, in fact, returning a minimum of one item, for instance. Should pass. We can also make sure it fails. If we're expecting, let's say, 500 books at minimum, this should fail. Change it back. And we can also scan for the maximum number of items that we expect to see. So we could use that 500 property at maximum. We have less than 500 books, so it passes. We wanna make sure it fails. We know that it's returning various books and not just one. So now we see that it fails again. Now, one thing to, to, that we could mention here is you can actually set these values programmatically as well. So you don't have to hard code these values. So if you were getting, uh, say, a parameter for the maximum number of items, if, if your API allowed for pagination, you can always grab those values from your parameters as well. So if the user calls it with a limit of 50, then you, you, can, uh, you can programmatically say the maximum items is going to be set to 50. Uh, as an example. So you don't have to come in and like change these tests every time mm -hmm. you can do that kind of work a little bit, uh, a little bit more programmatically in that way. Yeah, definitely a good level of insurance to make sure that we're not overloading uh, any server or any client side. Uh, yeah, aspects if we have way too much data or we have no data at all, but great idea to use variables or use programmatic ways. So we have built out these two endpoints, and it would be kind of a headache to have to go in here and kick them off each and every time that we wanted to do regression testing. So what we could use to have it run on a, a cadence is a Postman monitor to have these endpoints execute uh, at a time interval that we see fit. So we could use the left context bar of monitors and create a monitor that way. We can also hover over the collection, click view more actions, and select monitor collection. So here uh, we can give it a name. It'll default to the collection name, which is fine. Uh, we'll set the collection tag as its default. We don't need to use an environment. And we can check how often this monitor runs. So we can definitely run it at very fine intervals. But as always, uh, yeah, make sure that you're using caution to your uh, usage limits within your account. Mm -hmm. So we'll use the default of on every hour. But just to show, we, we could have it run uh, as frequent as every five minutes. We can automatically set a, a region. Uh, we'll set it to US East, but showcasing that we could see how these endpoints behave uh, across the globe. And we'll set it to alert Ian uh, for any failures that happen and leave the, the rest of the properties set to their default. So let's go ahead and run that really quick, Tim, just for the sake of time. We're, we're running low on time here. Oh, yeah. <laughs> some questions that we'd like to get to. So we can see here that this ran. If you want to dive in deeper on monitors, um, we can we can drop a link to the other Postman uh, videos. If uh, one of our moderators could go get that link and drop that in chat for us, uh, then you can go in and you can learn a lot more about monitors from there. Yeah, just for the, just for the sake of time, we're oh, yeah. running low mm -hmm. on, on time here. So... 
Cool. So what we went through today was just showing the benefits of, of what our contract testing was all about and how to use both the producer and the consumer side for just giving us that really strict confidence that our definition matches our examples, that our definition actually matches the open API specification. And then from the consumer side, adding even more schema validation uh, from inside of that. So we've got these additional resources here. If you want to grab a screenshot of this, these will be some great links that you can uh, that you can reference uh, for any upcoming Space Camp events. We've got a September event that's going to be added in the next couple of days, um, and it's going to be a special unboxing uh, session. So you won't want to miss that. And then we're planning out Q4 as well. So keep an eye on that. At the top of the page, there is a notify me button. Go ahead and, and add your details in there, and we'll notify you when we add new Space Camps. Uh, we've also got 30 days of Postman, and we have the Postman answers. Both of those are collections that you can work through and actually see uh, how to use different aspects of Postman. And of course, our community forum. we got lots and lots of really helpful folks there. If you've got questions that we didn't get to today, um, and, and we certainly do want to get through some of your questions uh, before we wrap up for the day. Um, but we do want to hear some feedback from you as well. So... Um, if one of our moderators could also drop this link in here, we appreciate that. Um, this will take you to a survey. Uh, we'd appreciate if you could take a few moments to fill that out, and then we'll dive in on some of your questions here. Um, so some of the questions that we had that I want to talk uh, really briefly on, um, Gilbert was asking, if, you're, if your company is not doing API first, um, but you have worked with generated open API specs. How does the workflow change? Um, so open, you know, what does API first mean? That that means a lot of things to a lot of companies. Um, I think as long as you have an open API definition, then the workflow doesn't really change that much. Um, and you can you can go through and you can generate all these tests. Um, someone else was asking, I saw something in the, in the chat earlier about, um, when Tim was walking through his section, um, is there a way to use the open API schema to actually generate, um, the, uh, the schema JSON. And that's actually what our other collection is doing is it's actually going through looking at the open API spec and it's actually building out all of those schema checks. And it's actually using the same AJV library that, uh, that Tim walked through. Um, we had another question from Bruno um, saying uh, all validation is based around this open API spec, but if I don't have that spec, is it still possible to use the button on the producer side to validate? Um, you can always generate an open API specification as well from that. Um, so we can look for a Postman collection called Postman to Open API. And there's actually some, uh, there's a collection built that'll actually go through and look at your collection. It'll actually create an open API specification for you. Um, someone else was asking whether we can run all these tests using uh, the command line. Yep, you can absolutely call these. So whether you're calling the producer uh, contract generator tests or the tests that, uh, that Tim wrote, as long as you've got a collection, you can build a collection runner and you can call that collection runner from Newman. So go check out the Newman command line tool. And from there, you'll be able to uh, to run these from the command line. Um, let's see, Tim, are there any questions in there that you want to grab as well? Uh, yeah, there's one from uh, Ibrahim. Hopefully I'm pronouncing their name correctly. One are the benefits of doing automated testing using Postman instead of other tools. Uh, yeah, I would say that Postman makes it really beneficial to do these forms of API testing that we just did. Uh, it's very easy to do through the interface. We automated test cases using scripts. We could use variables to save us some time rather than having to go back and change those parameters each time. Uh, yeah, we could have touched on not just gets here, but other HTTP methods, uh, other protocols like gRPC or GraphQL, uh, a lot of other Forms of testing with the APIs that we could have could have touched on today. Cool. All right. For the sake of time, I know we've we've gone a little bit over, so we do appreciate if you can take a few moments to fill out that survey for us. Um, there's just a couple of quick questions on there about your experience with the webinar today, um, and again, it does help us shape future Space Camp sessions. So we're looking forward to having everybody back for September. And uh, we'll make sure to notify everybody that signs up for that. Again, you will get a copy of the recording uh, through Zoom. As soon as the session is over, uh, they'll send you a link to the video that you can come back and rewatch. We'll also get it up on our YouTube channel as well. 
All right. Well, we'll wrap up there. Thanks again, everybody, for your time today. And thank you for your many questions. Um, thank you to the moderation team for uh, going through and answering many of those and, and saving some of the best ones for us at the end. And uh, we'll see you next month at Space Camp. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, all.